Last night, I flipped between CNN and, and Fox, um, occasionally watching football, but the election was closer than the football game. So I watched uh, both of those channels, and what I got was a totally different assessment, factually, of how much and whether there was fraud or cheating in this election. I'm going to tell you the truth. And the answer is, yes, there was some fraud. CNN was wrong when they said there was none. And no, there was not massive, massive fraud. I think the president was wrong when he tried to undercut the entire election by suggesting that it was all permeated with fraud. On The Der Show, you're going to get it straight down the middle. You're going to get it with nuance. So please stay tuned to The Der Show for my analysis. Last night, after the president uh, spoke about uh, massive fraud throughout the election, I was flipping the channels between CNN, MSNBC, and, and Fox News, occasionally tuning into the football game, but the election was a lot closer than the football game, so I, I stuck with the election as new votes began to come in from Georgia and from Pennsylvania, and we saw the status quo preserved essentially in the western states, Nevada and Arizona. But it was, to me, shocking to watch, uh, particularly Fox and CNN, uh, describe the state of uh, fraud or alleged fraud or miscounting in the elections. Uh, Fox was essentially, not all of the commentators, but essentially many of the guests, and <clears throat> many of the commentators, following the president's exaggerated allegations of massive fraud all over the country, claiming that basically write-in ballots are by their very nature fraudulent and that uh, the fact that Republicans weren't allowed to watch some of the uh, counting proves that there was massive fraud all over the country. Okay, then came CNN <clears throat> and their often cautious commentators went wild. They basically told the American public there was no fraud in this election, period. There was no fraud. There wasn't a single ballot that was fraudulently submitted. That's what CNN was telling the American public. Obviously, that's not true. There's never been an election in American history that didn't have some fraud. Of course, there was some fraud in Philadelphia. There always is. Of course, there was some fraud in other parts of the country. There always is. The idea that both sides are obligated to overstate their position. You know, it's as if everybody knows you're going to overstate your position. So maybe the only way to get people to understand the reality is to overstate it and then have the viewers discount by 10, 20, 30 percent. That's a pretty awful state we come to. It's just, it's just uh, uh, not what the media is supposed to do. Where do you turn to get a nuanced assessment? Where do you turn to learn that, yeah, there may have been some fraudulent votes in some cities and some states, yeah, that happens in every election, yeah. When you have massive numbers of write-in ballots, there are going to be more mistakes and more fraud than when you require people to come to the poll. That's the reality. But the amount of fraud was nothing in comparison with the number of voters who were suppressed uh, in previous elections and maybe some in this election. Where do we go for a nuanced assessment? Where do we go for a balanced analysis where do we go to learn that this was not a blue wave, that this was a, what appears to be, fairly decisive victory for Joe Biden over Donald Trump, personally, that uh, Joe Biden got more votes than any candidate in American history. Of course, there were more voters in this election than in any previous election, so you have to take that into account as well, but that the Democrats lost seats in the House, that it looks like at the moment they haven't overtaken the Republicans in the Senate, that they lost some uh, state legislative actions, and, and that it was a general victory for the Democrats, but not an overwhelming victory for the Democrats. 
Where do you go for that assessment? Where do you go to learn the truth? Well, one place you go is the Der Show, because I'm going to always call it down the middle. Yeah, sure, I voted. I'm not going to tell you I voted for, because that's not relevant to this discussion. I have strong feelings, but I don't allow my feelings to influence my analysis, unlike the commentators on most media uh, outlets uh, today, or apparently most pollsters. How do you explain the failure after 2016 when we saw massive failures of polls accurately to predict not only the ultimate outcome, but outcome state by state. Where do you, how do you get to a situation four years later when they didn't do very much better? When uh, the pollsters picked uh, Biden by a lot in Florida and Ohio, when it turns out, of course, the president won both of those and where you have what appear to be a strong poll bias in favor of Democrats over Republicans. Look, the president has said, and it's part of the Republican talking points, that this was deliberate, that it was an attempt to suppress voters through poll manipulation. The theory goes something like this. If you tell Republicans that there's no chance that they can win the election, that it's a foregone conclusion that the polls show it's overwhelmingly clear that the Democrats will win, well, then the Republicans won't show up. I don't understand that argument. Uh, it's just as likely the Democrats won't show up. If you tell a group of people they're going to win overwhelmingly and, you know, if they have two choices to stay home and play with the kids or stand online for a few hours, they're going to stay home and play with the kids if they don't think their vote matters. So I'm not sure that uh, polls that come out one way overwhelmingly uh, over the other uh, suppress votes on one side rather than the other, on the winning side rather than the losing side, according to the polls. I'm just not sure. I'd like to see the data on that, but it's not self-evident <clears throat> that the uh, poll suppression works to suppress polls on the part of the, of the side that is alleged to be losing the election. I just don't know the answer uh, to that. One thing seems clear today as it looks like, <clears throat> looks like, by the time you see the show, you may have some certainty. But it looks like now that uh, Vice President Biden uh, may not only win uh, Georgia and Pennsylvania, but also Arizona and Nevada, in which case he gets around 300 electoral votes. He wins fairly dominantly in the Electoral College, which reduces the chances that President Trump will be able to bring successful lawsuits. I think that's why we're hearing a change in the tone of the Republicans about the nature of lawsuits. When it looked like the electoral vote would be very close, maybe determined only by one state, say Pennsylvania, then the lawsuit could be targeted the way it was in Bush versus Gore. Bush versus Gore, only one state was targeted, obviously the state of Florida, where the count had uh, Bush ahead by 500 and something uh, votes. That's where the fight took place. Here, there isn't one single state, or at least it doesn't appear at the moment, there's one single state which will determine the outcome of the election. Look, if Pennsylvania definitively goes for uh, Vice President Biden, that will be 270. But then if he also wins the other three states, there won't be one state which will be the focus of attention. When it looked like Pennsylvania could be the focus of attention, uh, President Trump's legal team had a very strong argument, perhaps even a winning argument, uh, if the number of votes separating the two sides reflected the number of ballots that came in late but were filed in a timely fashion, because there you have a straight constitutional issue. The state legislature didn't allow those votes to be counted. The state judiciary did. Article 2 of the Constitution says it's up to the state legislatures. There are three or four justices who agree with that position. It was essentially the position espoused by at least three members of the majority, maybe the entire majority in Bush versus Gore, winning potential argument. That's not the argument that will win this election, though, if, in fact, Biden wins uh, the four states uh, that are now up for grabs and are all leaning toward uh, Biden. Then you have to make a very different argument. You have to argue massive fraud. You have to argue that inherently 
the use of mail in ballots opens up the possibility of fraud. You have to go state by state. You have to show that people didn't vote uh, or people did vote who shouldn't have been allowed to vote in Nevada, that people were dead or people had moved out of Nevada. Those are very hard cases to win. The difference, and I'll use a common term from shopping, the difference between retail and wholesale. Uh, the Pennsylvania challenge is wholesale. If it wins, it's just a constitutional argument. You don't have to begin to start uh, looking. You don't have to take evidence. Uh, that's the, the key point. We know how many votes were submitted late after, uh, were received late after being submitted timely. We know that because the courts have directed the uh, voting people in uh, Pennsylvania to segregate those votes out. So let's assume it's 10,000 votes that came in late. And let's assume that Biden wins the state by 5,000 votes. At that point, you could get the Supreme Court turning over that state election and handing the state over to um, President uh, Trump. That's what essentially they did in Bush versus Gore. That's an easy litigation. It's not the case in the other states. In the other states, you have to go vote by vote. There's no wholesale constitutional argument that to me looks like it has any chance of success. The only arguments that could conceivably prevail are retail arguments. Well, in Clark County, this happened, and in so-and-so county, this happened, and maybe these voters shouldn't have been allowed to vote or allowed to vote. So you begin to subtract a vote here, a vote there, 10 votes here, maybe 100 votes there. Do you ever get to a point where you can turn around the election? Very, very unlikely. I am aware of no situation where a court has ever turned around uh, an election on that basis, on the basis of retail, even Bush versus Gore, it was a wholesale analysis, equal protection, the issue of federalism, the issue of whether or not legislature or the judiciary prevails. Those were more wholesale issues than retail issues. So I do think that President Trump's chances of prevailing in the court are quickly uh, evaporating as he loses more and more states. And if he ends up losing Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, I think we'll see court cases, we'll see challenges. I don't know whether the president at that point will concede defeat, uh, apparently, according to the speech he made yesterday, where he talked about massive fraud without, as far as I can tell, evidence to, to back it. Um, maybe there is, but we have to see it. Uh, I, I don't think his chances of prevailing on the massive fraud theory will will work. I mean, the best the best ally he has are the Democrats who say there was no fraud, no fraud, zero fraud, no fraud, not a single vote, no nothing, nothing. Just listen to CNN. That's what they were saying all night last night. No fraud at all. We know that's not true. And when your opponent says something that's clearly untrue. It helps your case. It certainly helps it in the court of public opinion, because I assure you, in the next few days, they will be able to demonstrate fraud in Nevada. They will be able to demonstrate fraud in Pennsylvania. They will be able to demonstrate fraud, perhaps in, in, in Michigan and other places. There will be evidence of some fraud. How do I know that? Because never in the history of any democracy has an election been conducted without some fraud fraud. It used to be common in Chicago where dead people voted and people voted multiple times. It used to be common in Boss Tweed's New York. It's apparently still fairly common in Philadelphia. Um, but we have to see the evidence. But the evidence will be there. There will be some fraud and therefore CNN will be as discredited in the minds of the public and perhaps in the minds of courts as people on the other side who've exaggerated the amount of fraud. But basically, who are the victims here? The victims are you and me, the American viewer, the American listener, the American voter. We're entitled to get from our media some semblance of truth. We don't want media simply reading talking points of the various political parties, and we're getting that. We're getting that from both sides. So in my view, and I haven't seen the evidence and I'm going to withhold judgment, but I predicted 
that this would be one of the cleanest and fairest elections in American history, not because Americans have gotten any fairer or any cleaner or any better. It's just that everybody's watching. I think the Russians, the Iranians, the Chinese uh, have been caught. And I don't think they had an impact on this election. In fact, I haven't even heard allegations that they have influenced the election the way we heard allegations back in 2016. What we hear now is allegations, typical allegations. There was fraud here, there was fraud there, there was an unconstitutional act here, there was a pre prevention of poll watches here. That is all too typical of elections. But my prediction is in the end, the vote will stand. Uh, in the end, we will see a divided government. Uh, we will see the presidency, probably, and the House, definitely, in the hands of Democrats, the Senate, probably, but not definitely, in the hands of Republicans, because there are going to be some runoff elections, particularly in Georgia, where, you know, this election may have been determined. Georgia is becoming an extremely important state, both in terms of the presidential election and the, the Senate election. So we're going to see a divided government. That's the way the intenders, the framers intended it. That's the way the framers wanted it. They wanted a government of checks and balances. That means no court packing. That means no end of the filibuster and the cloture rules that have historically made it harder to push things through in the Senate. That means gridlock. You're going to have a lot of gridlock. That means compromise. That means both sides are going to have to come to the table. That means strengthening the center of both parties. I think another lesson we've learned from this election is for the Democrats, keep AOC and the squad to their own districts. They did very well in their own districts. They won. But the face of the squad definitely hurt the Democrats in House races, hurt the Democrats, I think, in, in Senate races and in local races. Exit polls show that there was, at least among Latino voters, uh, an association between the Democrats and socialists. And you can yell all you want that the Democrats aren't socialists, and Joe Biden is not a socialist. And, uh, I don't think the mainstream of the Democrats is socialist, but AOC is one of the most popular voices in the Democratic Party. She is a socialist. I'm not calling names. That's how she describes herself. She and Bernie Sanders describe themselves as socialists. And socialists are not going to win in America, not at least in my lifetime. Maybe you're younger than me, folks out there. Maybe in your lifetime, maybe we'll trend in that direction. I doubt it. We're not a country of extremes. We have always rejected the black and the red, the black of fascism and the red of communism. We tend to move toward the center. And I think this election is a centrist victory. Joe Biden is a centrist. He won because personally he is perceived as closer to the center than Donald Trump. Senate and House candidates generally, with exceptions, won to the extent that they were in the center. Exit polls show that defunding the police was a very unpopular point among many voters. So a centrist victory in a divided nation. Our people are more centrist than our media. Our people are more centrist than at least some of the leaders. So as we go into the weekend, and when you hear from me, beginning of next week, all of this will be determined. Um, Vice President Biden will be the president-elect. He will have 270 votes. There will be challenges in the court. As a lawyer, it's always fascinating for me to watch these challenges. I have to tell you, I've gotten so many calls and so many requests and so many emails asking me, am I going to become part of the legal team in this election? The answer is no. I was part of the legal team in 2000. I was uh, opposed to impeachment in uh, 2020. Uh, I'm going to sit back and, and observe and watch and, and comment. But what you're going to hear from me, what you've always heard from me, is a centrist, nonpartisan, non-exaggerated, not extremist analysis that represents the will of the American people, not what you hear on the cable television, not what you read in many of the partisan newspapers, and not what you hear from the talking points of both sides of the political 
spectrum. I wish the President of the United States had not gone on television and attacked the entire election process in the United States of America. We have a fair process. We are a real democracy. The President would have been better advised to focus specifically to produce evidence, to focus on the Pennsylvania issue. That's a legitimate issue. To focus on whether there were voters who should not have been allowed to vote in Nevada, but broad general statements, whether made by the president or the opposite made by CNN, do not serve the interests of truth, do not serve the interests of centrism, do not serve the interests of the United States of America as a fair democracy. You know, in a democracy, Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. That's the nature of democratic governance. Sometimes your party wins, sometimes it loses. Sometimes your candidate wins, sometimes it loses. But I'm going to make a prediction here today. The winners are Americans. This was an election that, although there was a lot of name-calling and a lot of exaggeration, a lot of extremism, in the end... The election reflects, I think, the will of the American people. When the Electoral College and the popular vote come out the same way, that's a victory uh, for uh, a democracy. We can't change the Electoral College system. Um, it's not going to happen. And sometimes you're going to get a situation like we did in 2000, 2016, where you have a deviation between the popular vote and the Electoral College. But when the two votes correspond on either side, Again, I'm not being partisan here. If, the, if it had worked for, for the Republicans and if President Trump had won both the popular vote and the electoral vote, I think that would be good for democracy. It's good for democracy when the Electoral College reflects the will of the people. It seems to have done so this time, but the will of the people is complex. It's also reflected in House races where Republicans did better than Democrats in contested seats. It also reflects the will of the people in the Senate election, where it looks like the Republicans have maintained control of the Senate. Does it reflect the will of the people on the Supreme Court? We'll wait and see. We are a messy democracy. We are a republic if you can keep it, as Benjamin Franklin said uh, many, many years ago. We will survive, we will endure, and we will be strong. You will hear that message and you'll hear it in a nuanced way on the Dirt Show. So thank you for listening and thank you for viewing. Now it's time for your voice to be heard. Uh, this is Tom. Hi, Mr. Dershowitz, Tom Wilson, a big fan of yours. I know you're honest and straight. This system we have of voting for our presidents is fouled up big time. You have one state, California, 55 electoral votes. You got New York how many was it 29 or so and you know the ethnic groups are about the same cultures probably dominated probably in, in the minorities by one ethnic uh, race and they all pretty well think alike they get uh, the same kind of information from all these web stations and corrupted uh, media outlets it just isn't fair. The forefathers would never have dreamed of this happening with one state dominating the whole country pretty well with electric electoral votes. The system fouls up, and it just upsets me to the max to think that Donald Trump, the sharpest man I've ever seen in my life, will not be elected. 99% chance. Thank you for your time. Well, you make some interesting points. Of course, the Electoral College actually minimizes the influence of California. If we went to popular voting, the number of people who live in California, California is one of the largest, quote, countries in the world with one of the strongest economies of the world. It would do very well as an independent uh, country. Um, the Electoral College actually minimizes its importance because it's a foregone conclusion which side it will vote for, and therefore very little campaigning goes on. The same is true in New York. The Electoral College maximizes the importance of swing states. As far as ethnic voting is concerned, I think we thought, saw quite a shift in that in this election. We saw a very significant number of Latino voters uh, voting for President Trump and voting Republican generally. A large part of that reason is that many of these Latino voters 
either come from or have families that come from countries that were oppressed um, by uh, socialist and hard left dictators, um, Castro and, and, and in Venezuela, and they vote against socialism and vote against what they believe is authoritarianism. Um, the same thing is true with black voters. If, if the data is correct, uh, more black voters voted for President Trump than previously voted for uh, candidates in, uh, on the Republican side. Look, we're a complex country, and you can't generalize. You can't generalize about regions. You can't generalize about uh, ethnicity. You can't generalize even about you know, Trump supporters. I hate when people say, how can you be in any way a decent person or a good person or an intelligent person? and vote for President Trump. I know a lot of decent and good people who do. Um, um, that doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It means they're different. And um, I just think insulting people, whether it be <laughs> calling them deplorables, as my friend Hillary Clinton did and hurt her a lot in 2016, or just what some of my other friends do in conversation, um, just demeaning people um, you know, President Trump was right. Uh, he didn't he didn't express it artfully, but he was right when he said, when you look at the people who want to tear down statues of leaders and people who don't want to tear down statues of leaders, there are good and bad people on both sides of that. I, I agree with that. There are no good people on the side of the Nazis or on the side of white supremacists. But there are good people on the side of those who don't want to tear down statues. I don't want to tear down George Washington's statue. I don't want to tear down Jefferson and, and Lincoln. And I think I don't want to tear down Lee. I want to maybe put him in a museum instead of putting him in the center of town. Uh, but that would be true of a lot of people. I don't want to see Malcolm X Boulevard necessarily named after that man who did some terrible, terrible things and was a racist. So if we want to start tearing down statutes and renaming streets, we have an interesting discussion we can have. But I think the election showed a lot of diversity and the virtues and vices of the Electoral College will be debating for a long time to come, but thanks for your call. Our next call is from Dave in California. My question is, is if the statute is clear that the um ballots in Pennsylvania must be uh, submitted by the election day, uh, and there's no other guidance beyond that, do you feel the court has the right to say, given the unusual circumstances of COVID, that the additional time shall be allowed? So that's my first part. And second, if and God forbid it does go to the Supreme Court, my question is, is in that case, why aren't we ever talking about the four justices on the left, now there's three, God bless her soul, uh, that, that seem to never look at the statute and just say, well, the right answer for our side is this. Hey, great question. Uh, first, let's go to the COVID issue. Look, I think the court did the right thing in Pennsylvania, saying we need to add three days uh, because of COVID. But the right thing doesn't necessarily mean the constitutional thing. The Constitution does leave that issue to the state legislature quite explicitly. So I can imagine the Supreme Court saying, yeah, it's reasonable what the judiciary did in Pennsylvania. We probably would have done the same thing if we had the power to do it. But we may not have the power to do it. It may be only up to the state legislature. Now, you can make a sophisticated argument. I would if I were the lawyer on the side of the Democrats. I would say it's up to the legislature. Yeah, but the legislature created the judiciary and the legislature allocated to the courts the power to make decisions of this kind to expand the number of days because of COVID. And so it is ultimately a legislative decision. Is that argument too cute? I don't know. But it's an argument that I'm sure will be made if it comes to it by the Democrats. Um, on the issues, just more general issues, of where we're going, you know, where we're going and where uh, the division of power and the Supreme Court. There's no question the Supreme Court is divided today on, on political grounds and, and the left and the right are, are equally at fault for creating that division. It's a tragedy that we have Republican justices and Democrat justices, liberal justices and conservative justices 
It would be much better if we just had justices. John Roberts, the Chief Justice, wants to move the court in that direction. I hope he will succeed, but I don't think that's the direction in which we're moving. I think we're seeing the politicization of the Supreme Court. Our next call is from Ohio. I'm really angry, though, at the lack of transparency that is ostensibly, happen is ostensibly happening in Philadelphia right now and that has happened in Michigan. Either it is the most extreme negligence, in that case there should be consequences, employees should be fired, their names should be blackened, they, they should go through all the things that normal citizens in America get docked for all the time, or it's conspiracy, in that case they should get federal, federal prison, and any decent, any, and I hope you as a upstanding and, uh, and law-abiding uh, um, person in the United States I hope you would agree with me. Any decent Democrat would want to get to the bottom of this and figure this out. Whether why it almost invites the claim: of what were they hiding? And is destroying the integrity of our elections. It, well, who, who's to say that in two years from now the Republicans won't do voter fraud mm -hmm. if this goes unchecked? It's going to seriously dismantle our democracy, and, and, and we should deal with it, and not just hide from it, and we go to the bottom of this. Look, I agree with half of what you said, but not the other half. I agree with the half that said we need absolute transparency. There's no reason why anybody should be prevented from uh, watching the counting of votes. Uh, if I had my way, it would be on television. Uh, we should watch every single vote. Uh, we should know why a vote is counted, why a vote is not counted. And there's absolutely no reason for not allowing poll watchers to come in. You have to restrict the numbers of watches, but uh, transparency should be supported by both the Democrats and the Republicans. Where I disagree with you is I don't want to put these people in jail. I don't want to use the criminal justice system. We can remedy problems in our system without immediately going to lock them up, put them in jail. So uh, as a criminal defense lawyer, I want to keep people out of jail, not put them in jail. I don't want to criminalize differences. Uh, I don't want to criminalize uh, poll watchers that we disagree with or election officials. But let's solve the problem and let's create more transparency. Our next call is from California. Howard? In the, if, if the Electoral College uh, vote is really, really close, what could be done to anything to be done to prevent the problem of faithless electors. Like in 2016, I remember Martin Sheen and Deborah Messing said, electors, change your votes. And uh, they thought that would help Hillary. But uh, two Trump uh, uh, Republican electors defected, and but, but five Hillary uh, electors defected resulting in less votes. Now, okay, that was fine because he won by 305. But what if it's a virtual tie in the Electoral College? What's to prevent the electors to uh, being, you know, like in um, making deals amongst themselves, like some sort of survivor thing? You could literally have one faithless sort of elector determining who the next president is. That seems terribly undemocratic. What can prevent that? Well, it's a great question, and the framers thought about it. <clears throat> in the framers' mind, there was no such thing as a faithless elector. In the framers' mind, electors were supposed to vote their own conscience. They were supposed to you know, take into account what the voters voted for. There were very few voters in those days. In the election, for example, of 1800, <clears throat> there were about 5.5 million Americans. Uh, a little over 1% voted in the election, 65,000, something like that. So there were very few voters because you had to be male, property owner, white, and some states Christian. Um, but um, right now, of course, we've changed the nature of the Electoral College, and they're supposed to be robots who simply cast the vote that the voters of their state told them to cast. The issue goes state to state. Um, states do have the power to allow electors to vote their conscience. Most states don't. There was a case that came to the Supreme Court 
this past year on a related issue. If we ever got a situation where it was 269 to 269, it's not going to happen in this election, but it could happen uh, in an election. And deals were made, that issue would go to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would have to definitively decide whether or not electors are free to vote their conscience or to vote their pocketbooks or to vote their deals. We don't know the answer to that question. We do know that what the Electoral College has become is very different than what it was intended to be when it was put in the Constitution more than 200 years ago. Our next call is from Florida. Regina. I'm a Trump supporter, and uh, I just wanted to ask you, when they were going to, uh, they were looking at Pennsylvania, and someone said that they need to stop counting because once the ballots are counted, they go into a box and they're sealed, and then they can only be recounted. But if you stop the count, that's when you can audit and review the ballot. But once they're counted, you can't review it. You can only count them. Uh, that was one of my questions. And um, the other one was, would they ever redo an election if they found there was a lot of evidence that there was um, a high amount of fraud and printing of ballots? And would they ever do that? Great questions. Uh, I was actually calling for a redoing of the vote in Palm Beach County as the result of the butterfly ballot, because in the butterfly ballot, people voted for Pat Buchanan, who intended to vote for Al Gore. But, you know, all the lawyers told me and Al Gore took the position that you'd never get a court to redo an election, even an election in one county. It's never happened. So we don't know uh, for sure. As far as counting, uh, what you can do is instead of stopping the counting, you can require the county to continue, but continue in a way that allows you to then monitor whether or not the votes were uh, legitimate. Um, I don't know for sure. I've heard that, that once the vote is counted, you can't trace it to a particular person. You can just look at the ballot. If that's the case, then it's a, an argument for some kind of change if the challenge is to so-and-so shouldn't be able to vote, say the Nevada challenge that we've heard about, that dead people are voting. You should stop the count if there's a plausible argument that dead people are voting, and you couldn't learn that after the votes are counted. That would be a good argument for stopping the voting. But if you could learn afterward whether or not there were dead people who voted, then there's no reason to stop the count. Our last call today is from Karen in Florida. Hi, I have a question uh, for the Durst Show. Um, the question is, everybody I see so much on social media and Facebook, and I'm wondering, uh, since the Senate is Republican, if Biden comes in and is elected um, and is the due president of the United States, what can and what cannot he get through in terms of we ha he, everything he would propose um, would have to go through Congress, if I'm not mistaken, um, since the Republicans hold the majority in the Senate, um, can, can that potentially block the mandatory vaccine he's talking about potentially for COVID and um, tax increases and, and so forth that he might propose? What can the Senate block from getting through his policy? And the next question is, what could he get through as an executive order, um, therefore, you know, circumventing both the, um, the House and the Senate and Congress in general, and what could he get through and, and so forth. So anyway, that's my question. Great question and really a very important question because it will happen. Now we're going to see hypocrisy on steroids because when the president of the United States was a Republican and the House was controlled by the Democrats, we heard Republicans say executive order, executive order, executive order, president can do everything, president can do it by executive order, president can do it by executive order. Now that we're going to probably have a Democratic president and a Senate probably controlled by Republicans, 
we're going to hear the same Republicans say, no, 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 it has to go through the Senate. No, no executive orders. We should keep executive orders limited. So we're going to hear a lot of that uh, switch of views. You know, nobody passes the shoe on the other foot test, but you put your finger right on it. Uh, you can have no legislation without the agreement of both the Senate and the House. That doesn't mean that Republicans will always get a veto. There are always going to be some Republicans who may be willing to make deals with the Democrats. Susan Collins, for example, has won re-election. She's somebody who has made deals with the Democrats, as has the Republican senator from Alaska and some of the other senators as well. So we may get legislation through, like, for example, <clears throat> regarding vaccination. But the Senate does have a veto over all legislation. And so the only things that can get through without legislation are matters that are within the province of the executive branch, the president. Those are increasing. The president, we know, has control of foreign policy. So uh, a President Biden could get us back in the Iran deal. I hope he doesn't. It's a disastrous deal. It's a green light to the mullahs to develop a nuclear arsenal within five, six, or seven years. So I hope he doesn't do that. But he has the power to do that. But then a president four years from now could undo it. So the vice and virtue of executive orders is the vice is the president gets to do it himself. It could be very undemocratic. The virtue is that the next president gets to undo it, whereas legislation is much harder to undo because you need both houses to agree and then the president not to veto. So we're going to see stalemate. We're going to see the use of executive orders. We're going to see efforts at compromise. For example, the stimulus bill uh, will now have to be a compromise bill if it gets passed in the next uh, Congress. Um, we're going to see democracy at work. I think Joe Biden said yesterday that democracy is messy. Boy, is it messy. And, you know, what I hope we'll see is a movement toward the center, a movement toward nuance, a movement toward compromise. That's essentially what you always will hear on The Durst Show, a rejection of extremism, a rejection of exaggeration, a movement toward the center and nuance, and a search for truth. And as I promised you before, You'll never be bored. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show.